Oh my god, that episode was so good! I'm really enjoying this story. I think the pacing has definitely got a lot better. We've, we've slowed down a bit. I'm not going to say we've slowed down too much yet. I think the way that the story is going is really lending itself to allowing us to meet every character and get to know them before getting another character introduced properly. And that's working really well because I personally found in previous iterations, like they've got so many characters to get through and it can be really difficult to keep up with them all. But obviously having less characters here means that we're able to learn about each one and get to know them before we have the next character fleshed out and we learn about their backstory and a bit about their motivations and all the rest. I'm very interested to see how the next episode plays out because we've obviously had it set up that the concert on the island is going to happen and something's happening with Chisato. I will get to that. Once again, going through my notes chronologically, Chisato living her best life. I was so excited when she got that offer. I was thinking, yes, you have to take it. You have to follow your dreams. Do not make concessions for the group. And I was all about it until the very end of the episode. I am, I am convinced that she's going to do the performance and then quit the dance course. Either move to the standard course or just not do dance anymore and then obviously join Leela. I, I have mixed feelings about that. I will get to them. These girls really love getting in one another's faces. Like there has been no personal space here. And even between the newer characters that get introduced, like Yuna and Kanon, getting it, oh, Yuna getting in Kanon's face. That was interesting. I'm not sure if that's a testament to Yuna's confidence or if this is just a new thing the writers are trying. I'm not opposed to it. I just, as someone who's lived in the world for the past year, I'm very wigged by personal space and breaches of. So, I don't know. Has there been this much, like, getting in one another's faces in previous seasons? I haven't watched them in a long time, so I honestly don't remember. The conflict between Sumire and Cuckoo is delicious. I love that they are butting heads. I still take issue with the fact that Cuckoo's drive is, I love school idols, and if you're going to be one, you have to respect us. Which I get, I understand that. But Sumire's a bit of a brat. Well, no, she is a brat. I love her, I still love her so much. Nothing will ever, ever stop that. But starting the episode with them fighting, I, I'm enjoying that so much. I love the conflict, I love the tension, I love the stark contrast between the two of them arguing and then Sumire fanning Cuckoo to make sure that she stays cool. Oh, I love it. I love it so much because it shows that we have two actually decently developed characters. They're both very strong personalities and in that regard, of course, they're going to butt heads. Having Sumire know when she has to throw in the towel is very good because if they both like stuck to their guns the whole time and were never willing to back down, it would get old very quickly. So Cuckoo doesn't necessarily win because of this, but it definitely means that Sumire is going to stop arguing with her before Cuckoo's going to stop arguing with Sumire, which I think is cool. I think that's good because it gives us, well, no, it gives Cuckoo a chance to develop. It gives her a chance to learn from Sumire. I wrote the note that at some point they're going to have to draw straws or do the um, bingo roulette thing to like get a space or a certain position and they'll get Sumire to do it and she'll get the, the like lowest number or the short straw or whatever in the same ways that Nico and Yoshiko did in the past and then she literally brings out the box of straws that from my perspective it was very good comedic timing but I can absolutely see that becoming a thing. Uh, the three-way rock paper scissors is very funny as well. There's always been that character that's had the sort of quote-unquote tropey bad luck which I think is cool. I really like those kind of characters and I'm not just saying that because Yoshiko is my best girl. Um, I think that bad luck as a character trait is not such a good thing, but bad luck as 
something that sometimes affects the characters is very good comedic relief, particularly in a show like this. I did scream when Sunny Pa showed up at the cafe. I had the same reaction as Cuckoo, admittedly. Um, <laughs> I love them so much. Oh my god. So, <sighs> Yuna's teeth, like, actually animated is the best thing ever. They're just so little and sharp. I love her so much. And Mao's hair covering her eye. Oh man, I am, I am weak. They have made this specifically to target my heart and they got a bullseye. Good Lord, I would lay down my life for these girls. Cuckoo, I am totally with you. And look, I will admit, I've only had one sort of quote unquote fangirl situation in my life and I say fangirl in a non-binary way I still resonate with Cuckoo reacting the way she did so much I get it I totally get it and I've done a similar thing where I've met someone that I really admire and I've presented them with something that I've worked on that I've been really proud of and they've reacted in a rather positive way it's so fulfilling and it means so much and that that whole like my little scenario meeting someone that I really admire is something that I hold so, so dearly. It's a time of my life that I look back on very fondly. It's something that I never thought I would get the opportunity to do. So I don't know. The characters in Love Live Superstar are just hitting home for me a lot. Like last episode with Sumire and this episode with Cuckoo. What's next, Sunrise? What else are you going to get me with, hmm? I really like that Sunny Pa is being so forwardly supportive. We kind of saw that with A-Rise and look, I'll admit, I love all the rival groups. I I think they're so cool and I'm so devo that we didn't get any live A-Rise stuff. Like they, they weren't at the concerts. I wish they were so badly. I, I think that if A-Rise had got the same treatment as Saint Snow, then I would feel a lot more connected to them, but unfortunately that is not the case. That said, I adore Saint Snow. I think their style and their choreography and just their energy in general is so, so good. And one thing that I really love about the rival groups is that they do contrast the main group. Like their songs tend to be a lot edgier and darker, but are still considered or can fit into the idol genre. As someone that does enjoy a lot of music, but particularly edgier stuff, the rival songs really, really resonate with me. That is why I am so keen to hear a full Sunny Pa song, because their costumes are gorgeous, the choreography looks gorgeous, but I need more, I need more of the song. They can't just keep giving me these little snippets, these, these little treats. I need a meal, please. Chisato going after Sunny Pa and asking them if the others could win the Love Live. That was really powerful. I loved that scene a lot. And the two of them explaining that, yeah, you know, their dancing isn't as strong as it could be. And that's literally because they've been mirroring Chisato. Like in the previous groups, we've had the choreographer be a core part of the group, which means that they can more easily incorporate their energy into the songs, like they are part of the whole song development process. Chisato is only here for the dancing, so she may be passionate, but that passion isn't translating to the others dancing. It's kind of conceptual, I guess, but I, I do understand where that could be coming from in a literal sense. I know a little bit about dancing, and I know that one thing that's very important is overextending making yourself seem as big and dramatic as possible because on a stage you are very small. So it's possible that if we were to pretend that this was a real life scenario, the actual Leela girls, like the current Leela girls, aren't learning the fundamentals, they're just learning the moves. But obviously this is anime and they can just say, uh, oh, there's not really any passion in their moves. So. Essentially what Sunny Pa did was give Chisato a reason to join. And I think that's a good way for her to get motivation. But I also think that Sunny Pa's input should not hold as much weight as it is right now. And what I mean by that is we 
saw the same thing happen with A-Rise, where they were like top of the charts and they gave the Muse girls advice and it meant a lot. In this scenario, we can assume that Love Live and the Love Live competition has been around for a number of years and that it's very big. There's a lot of competitors, there's a lot of interest, and it's a very well-known thing in this universe. So, oh my god. I'm recording a lot earlier than usual and I forgot my phone would remind me to take my sleepy bitch meds. So, I've completely lost my train of thought but I think I was done. Yeah, so it turns out that I actually didn't finish my thought, so I'm jumping back in to finish what I started, essentially. Sonny Pa's words holding so much weight in the same way that a Rise's words held a lot of weight feels very disjointed considering what we know about the world. And it's all well and good for Chisato to go after them for advice, but I feel like that advice should be coming from somewhere else, if that makes sense. In a lot of ways, the stories of Love Live are very restricted to just the characters that exist within them. And in the past, we've had the classmates and the teachers and the mothers of specific characters that have offered some level of support. But we haven't had that here. Obviously, we've met Kanon's family, but we haven't really met anyone else's family. We can assume... I think Cuckoo lives alone, so that kind of makes sense, but... In the grand scheme of things, Chisato shouldn't make her decision to quit based purely off what Sunny Part is telling her. Because if she's thinking, I need to quit so that the other girls can win the love life, then I personally feel that her motivations are skewed. They are not following the dream that she set out for herself. However, and I do mention this again in the future, if she is quitting to broaden her skill pool and so that she can continue dancing in a way that she is passionate about, then I feel her motivations are a lot stronger and narratively it's more interesting because she is still following the dreams that have been established and that plot point is still relevant. It's not just being thrown out the window. Moving on. I love that the, the group keeps teasing Sumide about the giant isopod thing. I think it's very cute. I get the feeling that's going to become a continuing thing. I don't mind it. I think it's funny. And as someone who kind of plays that role in my friend group as well, I definitely resonate with it. Yuna is an absolute gremlin, like pushing the others into the water and just being the most energetic little ball of fun ever. Oh my god, I love her so much. I'm I'm very emotional about Yuna and Mao. Like, they are just gorgeous. And I do like that in this run, we've met the rivals on a more personal level. But as it stands, we haven't seen a full performance from them yet. So we, the audience, have only been told, oh man, they're really good. We haven't been shown it. And in that regard, they've broken one of the, the major rules of storytelling, which is show, don't tell. Kind of like with, with Muse, when Honoka sees A-Rise performing on the screen, we are shown their skill, what they're capable of, and the kind of vibes that they bring to the table. This time, we just keep getting little clips and people saying, Oh wow, Sunny Pa! And that's... Okay, no. This is one of those situations where I'm not going to say it's fine, because it's kind of not fine from a storytelling fundamentals point of view. I personally really struggle with show don't tell. I over explain everything. I am an absolute exposition shithead. Something that I personally try to work on a lot in my writing is showing things instead. I ask myself the question, can this specific detail be shown? And if it cannot be shown, then I give myself permission to tell it. In this regard, in the context of Superstar, I think that it would have been better if they had shown us at least a solid like 30 seconds of performance and not just on a phone screen with the audio distorted, like no, give us part of their performance from the concert, please. Just give us something, give us more than Sumire looking over someone's shoulder or Cuckoo showing everyone else on a laptop. I. I'm not coming from a personal standpoint when I say this. I'm actually thinking in the context of 
storytelling fundamentals, we need to know what they're capable of. They cannot just keep telling us these girls are really talented. We need to see it for ourselves. I guess the same kind of thing happened with Kanon singing, but we still got her singing uninterrupted, unfiltered, just Kanon being Kanon. I kind of... I... I don't know how many more episodes they can not show us Sunny Pa performing for. Surely, surely in the next episode we will actually get them on a stage and we will see at least like the intro and first chorus of a song. That's all I'm asking. Please. If Chisato actually shows up at the concert, I will be pretty upset because that goes against everything they're kind of building her character to and the end of the episode really drives home that she's going to perform at this solo gig and then she's going to quit. I think that's the angle that they're going for. Which I personally think is not such a bad way for her to join the group because she gave dancing a shot. She got into what she wanted to do. She achieved incredible things and if she decides that it's not for her, that makes a lot of sense. I will take personal issue if she quits because of Kanon. I don't believe that characters should diverge from their goals, from their dreams, because of another character. And honestly, this applies to real life as well. But I'm not here to talk about real life, I'm here to talk about anime girls. Something that I usually take issue with in stories is when we learn so much about a character's dream and goals and then it gets completely derailed. And we have learned about Chisato's goals. We know that she wanted to be a dancer and she can still do that with Leela. She's just going to be spreading herself a little bit thinner. But in another way, she's going to be broadening her skill pool, which makes a lot of sense. Like she's still in high school and I personally know that trying to funnel yourself into one specific niche in high school is a really bad idea. Like... Look at me, I have a degree in fashion design, but I hate the fashion industry, so go figure. I think that if Chisato's motivations are sound, and that she is quitting the- assuming she is quitting the dance course, if she's quitting for legitimate reasons, that she wants to be an idol, this is something that she's passionate about, she's got my full support. If she says, I'm quitting to support Kanon, I will be genuinely upset. But we'll see what happens, I guess. I My estimate is that we will find out in two episodes what the outcome of that is. I believe the next episode is going to be performances from the new trio of Leela and Sunnypa. And maybe some Ren? Maybe, I mean, okay, Ren wasn't in this episode, but let's just talk about her for a quick second. If she shows up at the concert, oh man, that would be really juicy. I would actually really like to see that, but I'm not sure if that's the direction the story is going. Obviously, Ren has her own agenda. Well, I guess we'll find out what that is at some point. I have no idea. I don't even know how she's going to join the group. So, Sumire is definitely gay, right? Cuckoo probably also. I mean, they all are, but like... I, I thought at the end of the last episode, the preview was Sumire kissing Cuckoo on the cheek, which she pretty much basically did, let's be honest. Cuckoo's sleeping arrangements are as specific as mine, so mood. <laughs> I I really enjoy seeing this really serious side of Kanon where she's so in the zone, she's focused, and she just tells her friends, don't talk to me. Oh man, I really, really like that. And I commented on this in the first episode that I like that the protagonist has this really sort of kind of gritty, serious side. And it's come back. I, I thought I had in the back of my head, I was like, oh, is, is, are we going to get that serious Kanon again? I'm so glad we did. It's one of my favorite things about her. I hope it continues because it's a very important thing to her personality, I feel. And if they take it away, she's kind of just another orange protagonist, which is a trope that I've spoken about in my Nijikaku presentation. If you'd like more information, please let me know. I will re-record that. I feel that Chisato is planning on going out in the blaze of glory. She's going to completely kick ass at the competition, and then she's quitting the dance course. I think that's cool. I really want to see her perform solo. 
I want to know more about her as an individual character and not just as a part of the group. This is something that I've taken issue with in the past is that we don't see a whole lot of the characters outside of the idol group because there are so many characters. I like that we're getting more backstory and more attention to detail on these guys because we have the time. It's excellent. I'm really, really enjoying it. As I said, I love the story so far. I love that we've broken the trope. Like, we've got a fresh school, fresh start. Let's do something new. Finally. Honestly, like, I, I love Love Live, but I'm also extremely critical of it and the fact that it kind of did the same thing twice. And in my predictions, it also happened with Nijigaku, but I couldn't say for sure. I might watch Nijigaku one day. I haven't decided yet. I just have, well, no, I have three feelings about Nijigaku and they are all positive feelings for Shiriku, Lanzu, and Mia. That is all. I don't think they're in the anime, so why would I bother, honestly? Ren's solo voice is so pretty. I do think it's a bit weird that we got her solo song at the end of an episode that she's not even in, but I guess that's just how the planning sort of went. I do wonder though what we're going to get at the end of the episodes now because we've had a solo song from all of the protagonists, like all of the Leela girls. Are we going to get solos from Yuna and Mel, please? Please? I will do anything. I will lay down my life. Please give me solo songs for them. That would be awesome. It would be cool, I think, if maybe the episodes were slightly longer as a result. Like, it's... It would be interesting if they continued to do like, oh, we're going to do duets now, but I also think that it would be cool if we got that like little extra bit of time as episode content instead. But we'll have to wait two weeks to find out. This one was kind of longer than the others. Like, I just have a lot of feelings about Sunny Pa, I guess. I'll see you all in two weeks.